not exactly hidden. The scratching of pen on paper generally meant a lot of differing things in the galaxy. It could mean someone who wanted to express themselves and not be overlooked, or perhaps the physical sensation of the writing was therapeutic. It was also a method of increasing hand dexterity and maintaining it. Writing small, precise letters tended to do that. To say nothing of the security benefits of having information in such a way that you must physically possess what it's written on to have it. It also was a way to ensure loyalty. Little deliberate slips could be put into the writing. Lean them one way or the other and you could add some extra meaning to the word. A bit of a dip, a misprinted letter, a jagged line, things like that. It wasn't a code that could be trusted with the grunts, the leg breakers, the pushers, the basic organizers, and all those fools without ambition or appetite beyond their own petty indulgences were too stupid and short-sighted to be trusted with the code. Lean it to the left to reverse the meaning, the right to disregard everything in the sentence but that word. Botch the first letter to disregard everything after. Jagged lines mean start again and... And why am I speaking out loud? She asks with her mind in a fuzz. She clenches her eyes closed and feels off, like she hadn't had a full night's sleep despite her having an extra two hours. She scowls and twitches. The letter she was writing vanishes. The lights flicker despite her working under sunlight. She clutches her head and shouts in frustration. Reality crashes and the room is pitch black. She conjures fire in her hand and beholds a small man sitting on her desk, his legs folded under him and the light refracting off the glass lenses in front of his eyes to cast an eerie profile. Koga adjusts his glasses. Lean left to reverse, right to emphasize and discard the rest. A botched letter means ignore until the jagged line. But what does the dip symbolize? She scowls and levels a plasma pistol at him. Who the fuck are you, and what are you doing in my office? Hmm, I just lost a bet, Koga admits out loud. You were so certain she'd ask about the light first. Another voice asks, and she turns to regard the silhouette of someone leaning against the wall. She brightens the flame and chokes, a crown, a gown. There's a battle princess in her office. Mum, a lady! What are you doing here? Why are you in my private office? What's covering the windows? How can I serve? This was bad, very bad. The best way to deal with a battle princess was a poison meal put in place by the patsy of a patsy's patsy. There was precisely nothing she could do with one of them looking at her, nothing but beg. You could explain what the dip means, Koga remarks as he squints at the paper. It means something I... I'm sorry, why is a tret man with an eye condition sitting on my desk? If this is some kind of stripogram, I'm not unappreciative, but he needs to be a hair less curious. She says trying to find some humor and disarm the terrifying situation of a battle princess being in her office. It's one of my virtues, Koga remarks, and Miga Ver giggles into her gloved hand. But seriously, the dip? She's more than a touch dumbfounded at the sheer audacity of the tret. The entire situation is nothing short of absurd, and she's wondering if she's even left her bed yet with how surreal things have gotten. Her hand snaps out to grab her letter from the impertinent tret, and he simply vanishes with a strange sensation of power. That wasn't any kind of teleport she had ever witnessed before. There's the sound of paper being folded and she turns to see the tret, tucking her letter into his breast pocket. The sensation of fuzziness starts to wane as she starts to grow more and more paranoid. She staggers back and looks from the princess to the tret? No, not a tret. You're not the one that fought in the tournament, she mutters and he raises an eyebrow. No, I'm not. I'm someone he begged teaching from, Koga says as he sniffs. Madam, this will be a lot easier on you if you simply tell me the last part of the code. We're getting it out of you one way or the other. She looks from the princess to the human man in her office. Her mind starts churning and she builds up a tiny core of axiom. 
then unleashes it and is suddenly on a tiny pad with a tracing of Kutha gilding. She races out of the tiny panic room and towards her escape vehicle. A tiny two-person air car that looked like it belonged to someone without much of anything. It was perfect camouflage for those looking for a bank owner. You don't think we hadn't thought of this, had you? A voice asks after she slams the door shut and she turns to see another beautifully dressed princess in the seat next to her. In fact, the dress looks identical. There's a tap on the window and outside there's a dark-skinned human with his tightly braided rows of hair a massively contrasting pale yellow. Last chance to make this easy on yourself. Imagar offers and she warps back to the panic room pad and starts rushing out another direction in order to... A dark-skinned hand grabs her around the throat and lifts her off the ground. We tried to be nice. Then there is darkness. So, what have we learned? Koga asks as Duromari returns. She is indeed a regional boss. She knows several others up and down the coastline, and there's a level of boss above her, and she suspects a level of boss above that. The boss above her set her up in her cushy job to money launder and to deliberately spend enough money for there to be the wiggle room of a healthy organization. So she's both a deliberate money sink and a cleaner, Koga remarks in thought. Kitchen work then, Dale remarks, and there's some scoffing at the bad joke. How aware of the Orega girls is she? Not very. We're off the grunt work, but this woman's closer to an accountant than anything else. She knew she was dealing with criminal work, but was never directly told. Someone dimmer than her could have done the same job with no idea that they were part of a criminal syndicate. Duromari answers before thinking. Still, we're at the money level of the organization. Every part of any organization is connected to the money in some way. I got a lot of names out of her. Other banks at this level to handle cash overflow, a general overlook of their territories and the location of a very, very big file she suspects is full of blackmail for almost every governess up and down the coast. Our little launderer was sitting on a mountain of dirt. And where's the file? I gave Brandon the location. He... Duromari's explanation is cut off by the door to a nearby house abruptly opening. Brandon steps out and tosses her a large data chip. It's nearly the size of her palm. It was exactly where you said it was. I cracked the password on it, but the first thing you should know is that that brick is full. There are literally kilobytes of free space left and that sucker handles petabytes easily and it's damn near fucking full. There are planetary libraries with less in them. Not true. There are hollow films that take up terabytes of data. A proper library has hundreds, if not thousands, of them to rent out. Hilg Jute notes, and there's a pause among the human men. We need to get you boys out of the forest for a bit and into more public avenues. Regardless, there's still an obscene amount of data on the chip. Even if it's all in video form, it's a lot. The rot is deep, and it's getting into the parts of society that need to stay clean of that filth, unless we want Serbo to start resembling the worst parts of Centris. Brandon asks, and there's a pause. Could we not? There may be much about Centris to recommend, but it is not anything like how Serbo is or should be, Miro Noir asks. Can we get a look over the territories of the cartel? There may be a pattern. Vernon asks out loud, and Duro Marie brings out a projector and begins fiddling with her communicator. Moments later, the coasts of Serbo and a fair chunk of the inland are lit up, but only when it attaches to the coast. So there's something to do with the water. Bryn Char notes as he considers, I did chase them down to a port town, however. Old age getting to you? Koga teases him, and he snorts. Concussion, actually. I got hit pretty hard during that fight, Brinchar says with a grin before thinking. I hadn't thought it odd, but they did head to the water then. There's nothing but pleasure boating and the like. Most historical cities are there when they're not built around the older spaceports or the towns between them on the trade routes. Could they have gone into the water? It's possible to build in space, so building an underwater base should be almost trivial. Vernon asks and Brinchar gives him an odd look before turning back and then considering. 
that would do it. But why? Well, we haven't found any major storage facilities for drugs or for slaves. They have to be holding them somewhere. And a while warehouses that have had expanded interiors are fairly easy to come by, they're also all registered and regularly inspected to ensure that there's no collapsing of the waveform and having the place detonating by suddenly having a skyscraper's worth of freight inside a single story building. If they were to use private docks and boats to pick up product from a hidden base in the water, then it would explain not only this pattern of the most dense distribution being at the coast, but it would also explain why we haven't found anything. But there are surveys to keep track of leviathan breeding populations and numbers. Those things are dangerous above the black water. Depends what they're trying to take a bite out of. Miro Noir remarks as she remembers the lovely feast that had ensued after her last encounter with one. And there are ways to repel them. Sonic frequencies that agitate the beasts and drive them away. Furthermore, the surveys are a matter of public concern. They're not being hidden and are actively disclosed to anyone who bothers to look for them. Hell, it's part of the standard package for buying a boating license. You have to show you know where to get the information. Using the sonic repellers and staying in only the most recently surveyed areas, you'd be able to keep a fairly large facility both safe and secret so long as it was also mobile. Duro Marie explains as her eyes grow wide at the idea. You wouldn't even need to keep it a secret. Register it as the private condo of an eccentric private citizen that admires the Leviathans and you're outright expected to be there. No better hiding spot than where no one questions your presence. Imigar considers out loud before nodding. I think we need to go through that data and see what we can about beachfront or underwater facilities. There's not much call for such a thing on Serbo. It should stand out fairly blatantly. I'll look through too. I know the names of a lot of things about it. I've been in more than a few too, Darechar Crushclaw says. Are you certain? I've been trying to keep you out of this. I'm fine, Dad. This is just me looking for a house. Nothing scary or dangerous, Darechar says with a bit of a grin. Actually, I can probably teach you a bit about underwater architecture. There's a lot of different things to account for. I think I'd like that, Brinchar notes with a bit of a smile. You two should also look for private spaceports and shuttles. There's no way they could sell in a pook boy on Serbo, so they have to be transporting them off-world, Duromari remarks before pausing and crouching somewhat to look Darechar in the face. She then pulls out a lacy handkerchief and licks it a bit before rubbing out a spot on him. Oh, ew, ew! Darechar flinches back and hides behind his father. Sorry, you're just a cute scrappy little thing and I needed to. Duromari remarks and Brinchar chuckles. Sorry, little buddy. You're at that wonderful age where you have dignity, but that just makes them want to baby you even more. Brinchar remarks. Oh, and you're an expert on this? It's the age I was when my wives finally pinned me down. Brinchar notes and Darechar pauses. Oh, you! They talk you into healing to this age, don't they? Now, now, I don't ask what you do with your wives. Don't ask what I do with mine. I don't have any wives, Darechar protests. Yet, you don't have any wives yet. You've got the Char family good looks and you're training to be a sorcerer, Brinchar teases. 